Hello, everyone. Welcome to the China Brief. We bring you the latest global media coverage on China's current affairs, economy, and society, as well as exclusive analysis. Our trustworthy, professional, and multi-perspective China reporting provides judgment and decision-making references for the world's elites. The China Brief is issued in multiple languages, including text, video, podcasts, and books, and is broadcasted 24/7 in the six-degree world. China's hidden local government debt soars to more than eight trillion dollars. Nikkei Asia reports that China's off-book local government debt has increased by 50% between 2019 and 2022, reaching 59 trillion yuan, 8.25 trillion dollars, at the end of last year, according to a report by Rongding Group. Local government financing platforms (LGFVs) are an alternative means of financing for cash-strapped local authorities, which are restricted from raising funds through means other than bonds. The accumulation of debt has increased the interest burden on local governments, with a sharp decline in tax revenues and land concessions playing a role. Here is the China briefing. China needs more taxes, risks middle-class backlash. Bloomberg reports that Chinese President Xi Jinping may face pressure to oversee a national tax increase in the coming years. China has previously implemented massive tax cuts that resulted in taxes accounting for only 21% of GDP in 2021, compared with about 27% in the United States. Less than 10% of China's population pays income taxes. The country's financing model, which relies heavily on land sales and profits from state-owned enterprises. Is no longer sustainable as urbanization slows and demand for new housing decreases. Many Chinese cities are struggling to pay wages and debt, and the government will need to increase social welfare spending as the population ages. To address these issues, China needs to move to a tax system that relies more on direct taxes, such as an income tax. However, there are challenges to implementing such a system. Including resistance from the wealthy and middle class, who own a great deal of wealth in terms of housing, the government may need to find a compromise between tax increases and spending cuts to meet the fiscal challenges. Here is the China briefing: Oil demand to shrink by 2028. The International Energy Agency (IEA) predicts that global oil demand will shrink. By the end of the century, due to soaring prices and concerns about energy security, the Independent reports. The IEA report notes that many countries are rapidly switching to renewable energy sources, leading to a decline in oil demand. Although demand is expected to grow by six percent between now and 2028, the IEA says peak demand is coming. The decline is attributed to the rise of electric vehicles, more efficient fuel standards, and the increased use of biofuels. The report stresses that oil producers need to pay attention to the pace of change and adjust their investment decisions accordingly. The IEA's forecast is based on current policy and market conditions, but it notes that oil demand could fall more quickly through more ambitious action. Here's the China briefing. U.S. in talks to deploy multi-domain army force in Japan. Nikkei Asia reports that the United States is in discussions with Japan to form a new multi-role army force as part of an effort to counter potential threats from China. The force, known as the Multi-Domain Task Force, would have long-range strike, air defense, intelligence, cyber warfare, electronic warfare, and logistics support capabilities. The U.S. Army has deployed multi-domain task forces in Washington and Hawaii, and in Germany, and plans to build more. The forces in Japan will help distribute U.S. forces in the Western Pacific, bringing them closer to potential threats in the region. This is China briefing. Hong Kong needs more welders, not bankers. Bloomberg reports that Hong Kong is facing a divided labor market. With a white-collar decline and a blue-collar boom, similar to the United States, Wall Street banks are starting to cut jobs, largely due to rethinking their China strategies, overhiring over the past decade, and a lack of trading and deal activity. 
Meanwhile, jobs that don't require a college education are in high demand, and the construction industry is particularly short of workers. Blue-collar jobs have also seen significant pay hikes, while bankers are experiencing steep bonus cuts. As Hong Kong's financial sector faces capacity cuts and blue-collar workers see resilience and improved cash flow, rebalancing is expected to continue. Here's the China briefing. ByteJump hopes to build a universal app to rival WeChat. Bloomberg reports that ByteBeat, the parent company of Shakeen and TikTok, is expanding its business beyond social media into an everything app model. Jitterbug, China's most popular short-form video app, has had success with its takeout experiment, allowing users to place orders for takeout through the app. The company is now focused on providing a range of on-demand services, including food and grocery delivery, flight booking and hotel reservations. It is estimated that by 2025, Jitterbug could facilitate $42.1 billion in on-demand transactions, generating more than $2.4 billion in revenue from its commissions. If it succeeds, ByteDance could become a major competitor to China's largest internet conglomerates such as Tencent Holdings and Alibaba Group Holding. Here's the China briefing. EU removes Chinese firms from sanctions list for military goods flowing to Russia. The South China Morning Post reports that the European Union EU, has narrowed the list of Chinese and Hong Kong companies that it plans to sanction for funneling banned European goods to the Russian military. Three companies remain on the draft sanctions list, down from the initial eight, after China pledged to ensure companies stop reselling European-made high-tech products to Russia. The measures are part of a broader package of sanctions designed to punish Russia for its invasion of Ukraine. Here's the China briefing. Blinken plans to meet with senior Chinese officials in Beijing. The New York Times reports that Secretary of State Anthony Blinken will visit Beijing on Friday to discuss the importance of maintaining open lines of communication with Chinese officials and to raise concerns about bilateral issues as well as global and regional affairs. This will be Blinken's first visit to China as Secretary of State, and it is hoped that a series of visits by senior U.S. officials to China will take place this summer. The visit could also pave the way for Chinese President Xi Jinping to attend a leaders' summit in San Francisco in November. Huang Yongyu dies. Sing Tao Daily reports that Wang Wingyuk, an artist known as a ghost of his generation, has died at the age of 99. Huang's children have released an obituary saying that his father passed away at 3.34 a.m. the day before June 13, and that they followed his wishes not to hold any farewell or memorial service. Wang's will was also made public, stating that he wanted his ashes to be returned to nature as fertilizer. Wang had deep ties to Hong Kong, having settled there twice and speaking Cantonese fluently. He is considered to be a major influence in contemporary Chinese culture, with his outstanding talent in poetry, calligraphy, painting and woodcut sculpture. Huang Yongyu was born in 1924 in Fenghuang County, Hunan Province, and belongs to the Tujia family. In 1948, at the age of 24, he moved to Hong Kong with his wife, Zhang Meishi, and worked for Takang Pao and New Evening News, where he held his first solo exhibition. In 1953, encouraged by his cousin, the literary scholar Shen Kang Wen, Huang returned to Beijing to take up a teaching position at the Central Academy of Fine Arts. In the years that followed, his works showed a surprising diversity in terms of quantity, style, medium, style and subject matter. During the Cultural Revolution, Huang Yongyu was persecuted and branded as a cow devil and snake god, and one of his ink paintings, Owl, was selected for the Black Paintings exhibition. After the end of the Cultural Revolution, he focused on ink painting and served as vice chairman of the Chinese Artists Association, and in 1988, he returned to Hong Kong and became close friends with Jean Yong, James Wong, and other cultural figures. His works include Ashima, Monkey, in the Chinese Zodiac Stamps, 
and paintings depicting the landscape of Chairman Mao's Memorial Hall. He has also published works such as Six Chronicles of Yongyu, These Melancholy Scraps, Along the Seine to Villefranche, and The Wandering Man of the River of No Sorrow. He has held exhibitions in Australia, Germany, Italy, mainland China and Hong Kong, and has received the Italian Commander-in-Chief's Award in recognition of his artistic achievements.